everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Kelly with RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. Today I'm joined by Dr. Melissa Gonzalez. Um, we're here to talk about Hispanic health for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, for anyone who's joining us on the live today, if you have questions at any time, you can please type them in the chat and we'll be sure to answer them by the end of the program. And if you're joining us on the replay, welcome. Um, we're going to get started right away. Dr. Gonzalez, would you? Would you like to get us going? Sure. So just like Jamie said, thank you for introducing me. My name is Dr. Melissa Gonzalez. I am a family medicine physician. I practice in Neptune, um, New Jersey. Um, I am primary care. I, I subspecialize in women's health, non-surgical, GYN is what I usually do, but a full spectrum. So I have patients of all kinds of um, ages and conditions. Um, we are here celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month, um, which, you know, is a good place to start in regards to discussing health and Hispanics. And, and obviously, um, there is obvious racial disparities in certain um, topics when it comes to medicine and Hispanics. And um, with the climate nowadays, we're working to stop those um, or break down those barriers in order to provide equal care for everyone. So this uh, is a perfect month to discuss all those things. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but uh, about one in six people living in the United States are Hispanic. And when we mention Hispanic, we mean of Latino and Spanish origin. Spanish is, is uh, there's a play on words when we talk about Hispanic and Spanish, Spanish, basically is for individuals whose families come from, you know, Spain, um, East, that uh, European uh, background. Hispanics are those who are more indigenous, South America, Central America, um, the Caribbean. So that's where Hispanics and Latinos come into those play on words. So we do use Hispanic, Latinos, or Latinx for non-binary, um, but we are the largest racial ethnic minority group in the United States. Um, Hispanic death rate uh, con in compared to whites is usually 20% lower than whites. Most people don't know those numbers, um, even though we are, you know, we're talking about our, our, our increased risk, but generally um, our death rate is 24% lower than non-Hispanic non whites. Um, but we are 50% more likely to die from diabetes or liver disease uh, with compared to our non-Hispanic whites. Um, so heart disease and cancer in Hispanics are the two leading causes of death. Basically, they count for two of five deaths, um, which is the same for whites. So um, we mentioned that Hispanics have lower deaths than whites from most of the top 10 leading cause of deaths, with three exceptions, um, which is diabetes, chronic liver disease, and similar deaths from kidney disease, which basically comes about to being complications of diabetes. Um, our health risks depend partly on whether we were born in the United States or another country. So that's uh, another thing about caring for Hispanic patients or being in Hispanic origin. Most individuals, even though we're from different countries, we still share the same risks. Um, you do not have to be born in a Latin country to be considered Latino. Um, so that's that's a, a, an interesting uh, disparity as well. Um, Hispanics are almost three times as likely to be uninsured in um, as compared to our counterparts, which increase in general um, access to care, prescription medications, um, follow up, which is why those major deaths as far as diabetes, chronic liver disease, complications from kidney disease, that's where they go into effect because most of these disease processes require controlled follow-up. It's not like, uh, you know, you take one pill and then you're kind of done. So um, because of the uninsured issues, that's why we are also at that risk. Um, even though in general, and these most of these facts and all these numbers can be obtained off the CDC website, um, they are their evidence based behind it. Um, so um, as an aside, Hispanics in the U.S. are on average, we do, um, we on average nearly, we're five, 15 years younger than the average um, non-Hispanic white. Um, so that means that we basically have to take steps now to prevent disease, you know, the steps we take now 
helps prevent complications in the long term. So it doesn't matter how old you are. When people say, oh, I don't have high cholesterol, let me wait till I'm 40, 50. I mean, there are Hispanics who are 20s in their 30s with high cholesterol, and because they feel they're not old enough to be worried about it, it kind of falls underneath. So um, th that's kind of a general introduction on how, where our health risks are in the United States in relation to our, like I said, non-Hispanic uh, counterparts. So even though this is something we could discuss at the end, I wanted to kind of bring it up in the beginning on everything that we so far have discussed the most important things as a doctor and as you know whatever healthcare provider that you speak to whether it's a mid-level nurse practitioner um a physician assistant what us as doctors what we can do to for you as the patient is we work to eliminate language barriers uh, most patients um hispanic patients will speak spanish only and then they feel that if they can't um, confer or converse, then they kind of keep everything, questions, everything, um, they don't bother answering them. So in your practices, when you go to your doctor, it's going to be very important that you let your doctor know if there are any language barriers um, to eliminate those. Mind you, there might be, you know, not everyone has access to fancy equipment and interpreter lines and these interpreter TVs, but in order to minimize um, that, that is, is let your doctor be aware of that, that that is an important barrier that the, phys the provider may not know about because you don't, you've never mentioned it. So that's very, very key into establishing care when you go see your doctors to make sure that you can understand it. Um, our, our most important thing would be a constant counseling. You know, uh, you know, you we you have to understand that when physicians counsel, that is part of the treatment. Um, counseling is works just as good as a pill, even better because of no side effects. So your doctor will always be counseling on patient weight, on diet, especially if you're at high risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, or cancer. If you are a smoker. This goes across the board. It doesn't even matter if you're Hispanic. Your doctor will continually and persistently encourage you to smoke. If you are motivated, it will definitely be worth asking your doctor for help. Say, I want to quit smoking. What do I do? Um, it's also important that you, as a patient, utilize your health community workers. Most towns will have a hospital that they work with and in those hospitals are nurses who are dedicated in promoting the well-being of the health of the community they are known as community health workers there if you see a place doing blood pressure checks and screenings they're probably were organized by your local community health worker so um those are important pearls because they educate and they link patients up to free and low cost services which are big especially if we go back to saying that most hispanics are three times likely to be uninsured so those free and low cost services will be important for you so finding out those seeking them out the internet is an amazing resource for information. Um, Googling free low cost services will actually be big. So those are the main, if you are take away anything from this conversation um, over the next few minutes is um, we follow up, insurance, speak to your doctor, eliminate any language barriers. Um, don't get upset when your doctor is constantly counseling, counseling on weight control, diet, especially if you're already high risk. If you are smoking, we highly encourage you to quit. And if you need help, ask. Um, engage community health workers and link up for those free and low cost services. The um, going back into the top leading causes of death across the board, usually for non Hispanic whites, we have heart disease, cancer. Uh, COPD, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, suicide, and kidney disease. What is different when you compare non-Hispanic whites with whites is our risk for diabetes, chronic liver disease, and cirrhosis. Those are our top three risks. Um, um, I'm sorry. Those are our top three leading causes of death in the United States. Um, and this information was obtained through the mortality data files from 2013. Um, so with that said, liver, kidney, and 
<laughs> diabetes. Um, the reason why those increase, those particular diseases are increased is because our high propensity to be obese, um, U.S. born Hispanics are 47.1% um, have a higher risk of being obese than foreign born um, Hispanics, uh, U.S. born versus foreign born. And that goes back to my conversation of where you were born um, and smoking. If you're a U.S. born Hispanic, you have a 17.7 increased chance of being a smoker. So when you take into account obesity and smoking, obesity by itself already covers liver disease and diabetes. Um, and then obviously cigarette is increased for everything, lung disease, bladder cancer, cirrhosis. It does, it, it is a risk factor for most. So what we can do, so, you know, what we do as physicians and as patients, continue to follow up with your doctor. If you are diabetic, if you're at increased risk for diabetes, to evaluate your, I mean, constantly getting your glucose checked to see if you qualify for being pre-diabetic to being diabetic. Uh, Pre-diabetes is a new term um, that just came out and it was because they found more people at risk for diabetes than actually had diabetes. So you have about a whole population just warming up to bat to become diabetic. Now, if you can tackle those pre-diabetic patients they may never progress to that point, and then those risks increase as a population. Um, so, believe me, I, I, I'm Hispanic. I love my arroz con habichuela, gandules, papa frita, all that stuff. Unfortunately, our culture is very ingrained in a high-fat diet. Um, not across the board. This is obviously not uniform, and there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, but, you know, our diet is really not conducive for those risks, which is why they put us in those risks. Um, so now I know I had mentioned um, the risks of being an obese and a cigarette smoker when you compare U.S. born to foreign born Hispanics. But in general, um, Hispanic men age 21, age 20 and over actually have a 44.8 percent of men aged over 20 and 40 who are Hispanic are obese. That means half of our male population is overweight and at risk immediately for diabetes, high cholesterol, which leads to chronic liver disease, and then progressing forward to uh, CKD, which is uncontrolled diabetes. So right there is gonna be big. Obesity is the animal that Hispanics, unfortunately, have to tackle the biggest in order to cover the most amount of risks. Um, Hypertension, hypertension, 46.0% of men aged 20 and over with hypertension, Hispanic, by the way, um, are hypertensive, 46%. Those are significant numbers. It's basically every other male, because we've only been discussing male, mind you, females, have still around those same percentages, if anything higher. Um, those, every other person, you. Hispanic person is obese, has hypertension. Those are significant. Those are changes. These are what we call modifiable risk factors, meaning it's not predisposed by genetics and there can be something done with it. If you're hypertensive, you don't have to be hypertensive for the rest of your life. Consistent diet and exercise will be huge. Um, this comes back again. I, I know this is a you know a shortened lecture, but um, obesity, hypertension, uninsured is a big topic. I guess I know I had mentioned it again, but I really want to shoot that point of cross of what things can be done from that perspective as far as finding care and having accessibility to that. There are a lot of resources. Um, the federal government, you know, helping eligible Hispanics get insurance through the Affordable Care Act is a um, something that the federal government provides us as a service. So if you're not insured, look about coverage. Um, contact the Affordable Care um, website, see what you qualify for. That's going to be your first step. Um, we also, again, working with your provider to eliminate language barriers, working with the community to find low cost free care services, um, you know, making a strong effort to follow proven health tips, such as quitting smoking, 
staying on medication to control pressure and cholesterol and maintaining a healthy weight by exercise or by walking um, is going to be huge. Those are the strongest efforts that you as a patient can make in conjunction with working with your provider on a healthy diet, low salt diet, learning about type 2 diabetes, learning how to prevent type 2 diabetes. Those are going to be our biggest things for our community. I know excellent. I kind of went on a ramble there. No, that's okay. That was a lot of really excellent information. Um, and I appreciate all of the very specific uh, details you provided in terms of, you know, like uh, risk percentages and um, age and gender breakdowns, because I think that really helps everyone understand their risk when they know, you know specifically who you're speaking. With. I think it's easy to say, you know, you're at risk for diabetes. With, that could be anyone if they don't eat, right? <laughs> so I think it's helpful to have those numbers. Um, I know some of it probably sounds a little bit scary if you're watching and you're a patient. Um, so I thought maybe we could talk about, you know, I know you mentioned some really great tools in terms of, um, you know, if you are seeing a doctor or at least if you are hopefully now going to make the effort to meet with a doctor after this webinar, you know, things to talk about with them, stay on top of. Um, but if you're in the in-between, phase, you know, like you're looking for a doctor um, and you haven't made an appointment yet, or you're looking for those resources to help you um, get an appointment or find some uh, either free or inexpensive care. What are some sort of day-to-day -day preventative tips you can give in terms of, um, you know, just help, helping to live like a overall healthy lifestyle? Sure. Um, so there, in all honesty, the USDA has a website and they do provide it in both English and Spanish. It's called watching what you eat. It really comes down to food. If we, if we want to look okay. at the basis of obesity, diabetes, cholesterol, it really comes down to food. Looking at your plate every, I mean, we eat what, at least three times a day, most mm -hmm. individuals um, who have access uh, to, you know, to, to food, um, readily available food, you know, look at what you're eating. You know, everyone, um, I had so spoken to a nutritionist once, everyone kind of knows what's good and what's bad at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of look at it and eat. if you get a, like a guilty feeling, you kind of always look, make every bite count. Mm -hmm. Look at your plate. Are you looking, I mean, are you looking at a tons of fried foods? You know, do we have green in there? Let's add some more green. So it really does start at what's in front of you and making every bite count. Um, the USDA has a website, www.myplate. Dot gov. Simple myplate.gov and it provides you with a lot of information on healthy eating, plenty of resources um, like that. I like that. Um, I like what you said too about um, getting some green on the plate. Uh, I don't know if they still say it, but I remember being a kid, they make you take like, I think like nutrition in gym class or, or whatnot. You know, they used to like say all the time, like the more colorful you're The more is. colorful, yeah. Yeah. Simple, the, simple changes the where you have to is. go out. Those are, it, it, like I said, it starts right with what you're eating. Making every bite, that's gonna be my new catchphrase. Make every bite count. <laughs> I, I like that. And I, uh, I think that um, food is a, a great approach. Cause I mean, like you said, um, at the very least, I think everyone likes eating. Um, so, and, um, you know, I think, you know, when you talk about diabetes and hypertension, those two things are linked so closely to what you eat. Um, if you are at a higher risk for diabetes, will diet alone, um, be enough? Or is that like a deeper conversation to have, you know, if you're saying, listen, like it I'm is eating these healthy things, um, you know, I'm, I'm keeping X, Y, and Z to moderation, um, you know, would that be enough or are these additional conversations to have with your physician? So great question. Um, unfortunately, medicine is traditionally not once, one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. I have, I have had patients who tell me that they're, they're hypertensive and cholesterol and they say, I don't eat anything bad. <laughs> I don't understand why I'm gaining yeah. weight. I don't understand. So unfortunately, sometimes it is a genetic component to it. Okay. People like to blame genetics on a lot of things. Um, there is a place for them. So that at that point, that is something, if you are stuck in a rut where you're like, mm -hmm. I, I am eating right. I, I don't, I'm exercising and, and my mm -hmm. numbers aren't going down. That's something you work very closely with your physician to identify because there's something missing and it does mm -hmm. take two people 
one person who's giving the history and the other one to look mm -hmm. on, to, to observe unbiased um, with those lectures. So if you find out that you're doing everything and it's just not working, definitely set up a, 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 to discuss with your provider. Excellent. Um, and I know that one of the biggest things we can do in terms of preventative care is screenings. Um, so what are some screenings you recommend? Um, and wh at what age do you recommend each screening? So very good question. Um, and I, I apologize. I didn't catch up on that. So most screenings are going to be universal. Um, other than colon cancer screening, which in itself has gone through a lot of changes over the last few years, most screenings are age based. So, for example, for screening for pre diabetes and type 2 diabetes, based on our increased risk, so we're looking at diabetes, um, chronic liver disease, and CKD. You don't really screen for CKD and you don't really screen for chronic liver disease, but you do screen uh, for pre uh, diabetes and diabetes. And for pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, the U.S. Preventative Task Force um, is what, as the American Academy of Family Pediatrics follow, um, their recommendations for type 2 screenings and pre-diabetic screenings start at the age of 35 to 70 for anyone who is overweight and obese. And like we had just mentioned the numbers, 46% of Hispanic males over 20 are obese. So most Hispanic men, including women, should be getting their screening and their diabetes screening at least at the age of 35. Most doctors will do it sooner. And again, it's it's not a one size fits all. If if you are younger than that and you're obese and you have high blood pressure, we're going to screen you. Um, so screening is important, but they're mostly guidelines. You can go stray from them. Um, so the recommendation would be 35 to 70 for pre-diabetes. Um, like colon cancer screening that's done at the age of now 45. Um, screening for cardiac disease, which is usually done with cholesterol, um, is usually started at the age of 40. So everything is usually between 35 and 40 as far as screening for cardiovascular disease and um, diabetes, which is a high risk in Hispanics. Um, tobacco screening, no age. All adults qualify for tobacco screening. Um, including tobacco cessation screening. Um, for hypertensive adults, screening is usually done at the age of 18. So what that means is every time you go to the doctor's office and your physician takes your blood pressure, you know, when you go and you get vitals, he's screening you. That is an actual screening. So everyone should get screened over the age of 18, meaning every time you go to the office, you get your blood pressure checked. So that counts as a screening. So Following up with your doctor would be important for those kind of uh, risk factors. Um, screening for behavioral counseling, for healthy diet and physical exercise, uh, refer to all adults over the age of 18. Most of these recommendations will change as our risks for disease and death mm -hmm. adjust, but these are general recommendations. So they are similar to also the non-white Hispanics. So all screening is universal across the board. Excellent. Um, I know we're coming to the end of our time a little bit, and I want to give anyone who's watching live, if um, they have a question, they want to type it in, um, now is a great time. But I wanted to end just with two um, final questions. The one is about uh, mental health in the Hispanic community. I know we didn't touch on that, and I'm sure it could be its own, um, I mean, anything related to mental health could be its own um, webinar and discussion. Um, but I just wanted to, if you wanted to speak to anything in terms of screening, or um, you know, when to seek help, anything Absolutely. like that. Um, I think that'd be great. And then I just have one quick little. Sure. So let's, uh, depression also is definitely a recommended, uh, recommended screening. The USP STF recommends screening for depression in the general adult population, meaning anyone 18 and over for adults, mm -hmm. um, including pregnant women and postpartum women. Um, the screening usually is implemented by questions that your doctor will provide you at the beginning of a visit. There's things called the PHQ-9, and, and there's an also a screening for generalized anxiety. And di anxiety and depression, unfortunately, most individuals will not be always be able to tell the difference. But if you feel like you're having any of those sensations that could potentially be sent, um, shifting you towards depression or anxiety, um, your physician at your regular visit will screen you for depression at every visit. Um, depending on your score on 
those screenings will mm -hmm. determine what kind of diagnosis, effective treatment, and appropriate follow-up. And like I said, most of these are done with your doctor. You usually do not, you don't screen yourself. So following mm -hmm. up with your provider will be number one. Excellent. It's recommended, highly recommended. Yes, yes. Um, and I know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're we're almost at that time, you know, flu season time. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on annual flu shots. Absolutely. Um, yes. So um, the CDC, which is, you know, uh, it's where we get our numbers from, has basically said that people from racial and ethnic minority groups, and this includes African Americans, um, American Indigenous um, populations, are more likely to be hospitalized with the flu. Most individuals will not think go flu hospital, um, mm -hmm. but people, like I said, I had mentioned the higher risk groups, which include non-Hispanic Blacks, non-Hispanic American Indian, uh, Alaska mm -hmm. Native, and Hispanic or Latino, will have a high chance of being hospitalized um, with the flu shot. Um, and this, again, this there are many reasons for this racial disparity. A lot of it is, again, access to care. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of organizations that provide free flu shots. If you're one of them, Google it. Um, the CDC has a website that you can find flu vaccine facilities. Mm -hmm. um, increased exposure. Unfortunately, Hispanic and Latinos are more likely to be exposed to the flu because of the work jobs that we the, the jobs that we primarily work in. Um, we interact more with the public. We work in more crowded work conditions. Um, and because we often live with extended family, this also increases our risk. Again, being uninsured is gonna be a huge risk. And it does come down to lack of trust in doctors and traditional medical care. I get it. Um, mm -hmm. Many studies point to a lack of trust in doctors, especially among Hispanic, uh, non-Hispanic black individuals. Um, where they felt like the doctor wasn't working in their best interests. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, there are more, you know, it, that's something that you have to develop over time. But mm -hmm. because we are high risk, definitely getting your annual flu shot is going to be your biggest health or the biggest move you make in your health. Mm -hmm. Flu vaccine is safe. It's been out for decades. There are very few side effects. Um, knowing that your arm may be sore for a few days and knowing that that's part of a side effect is also part of that trust. Knowing that you may get a low-grade fever, you may feel tired. None of this means you're sick with the flu. The flu vaccine did not give you the flu. This mm -hmm. is all part of the immune response. Um, the flu shot will prevent you from getting, may not always 100% prevent you from getting the flu, mm -hmm. but getting the flu vaccines means you'll be less likely to be hospitalized from the flu. So as long as you're six months and over, everyone should get a flu vaccine every year, which usually starts around this time and ends in March, usually the flu season. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. Sure. Uh, I really appreciate all of, um, not just the information, but like the attention to detail for all of this information. Um, because I, th I think, like we've said, uh, it's really important to know, like, really specifically who we're talking about um, and what your risk specifically is. Uh, I think it's easy to just say you're at risk for this. Um, and then that sort of gets lost in, like, the everyday noise of, well, I've got 100 other things to do. Um, so I hope if you're watching, you've enjoyed. I don't see any questions in the chat. I'll give it another few seconds in case anyone is typing them. Um, but otherwise, thank you again for joining us. And um, if you are watching the replay, thank you for being here. If you're on the live, thank you for attending and have a great afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to make one big comment that in oh, the, sure. point, I know we had set up, obviously the relationship with the doctor is gonna be huge. Um, I'm not sure if we provide on the website, but um, the RWJ app will be able to find local providers if you do not mm. have one. So please utilize those resources as well um, on, you know, basic, based on where you live. Um, if you don't have a primary care doc, that would be your first step. Yes. Um, and I think that's where hopefully you build a good relationship with like medicine on a whole with your primary care doctor. That's right. That's what I would say at least. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye.